Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2014 documentary uh, Lost Soul, The Doomed Journey of Richard Stanley's Island of Dr. Moreau. That's a long title, too long in my opinion, but it is a good documentary and I would recommend this to anyone who's into horror and especially anyone who's seen Color Out of Space, which is the film that Richard Stanley made his uh, way back to film with, basically. Well, officially, like theatrical film so anyway um if you have not seen this already just know there will be spoilers as i talk about it uh but regardless any everyone should see it, it it's it's a very interesting documentary that kind of lets you know exactly what can go wrong with big budget films and with this particular film island of dr moreau it really does seem like pretty much everything went wrong uh and it documents that well so i i think it's a well done documentary so Written and directed by David Gregory. Now, he's done other documentaries that I have not seen, but have a lot of interest in seeing. And here's some of the more interesting ones. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Shocking Truth. The Joe Spinell Story, which is about Joe Spinell, the guy who wrote and stars in Maniac. Um, the Godfathers of Mondo, all about Mondo and their films. Ban the Sadist Videos, about, you know films that got banned and i think there's a second one of that documentary forget everything you have ever seen the world of santa sangre which i have not seen that film but i need to it's one that's been on my list for a while what's in the basket which is very very uh interesting for me and i need to get my hands on that because it's about the basket case trilogy by frank henenlotter and i'm very interested in that i like henenlotter Master of Dark Shadows, which is a documentary about the Dark Shadows TV show that was on some decades ago. And then the last one, which is the most recent one that he's done, Flesh and Blood, The Real Life and Ghastly Death of Al Adamson, which was put out by Severin, which this documentary is also put out by Severin. So if you want to get it, it's there. Anyway, so let's get in into it. I think it's important that they actually started out this film establishing who Richard Stanley actually is as a person, but then also what was kind of happening in his life leading up to him getting the director uh, job for The Island of Dr. Moreau. So it, it, it's a good way to do it just because instead of jumping right into it and being like, oh, things are going wrong and there's this dude, Richard Stanley, because they decided, or David Gregory decided, that when he was going to do this film, he wanted to do it from the standpoint of Richard Stanley and how basically Hollywood chewed him up and spit him out in a sense. And I'll talk about, you know, some ideas on kind of what exactly went wrong. And I, I think there are some things that, that were a bit malicious that ended up happening, some things that were a bit negligent and some things that just happened that created the perfect storm in a way for things to just be terrible and, you know, make Richard Stanley swear off making film for a certain time. And I'm glad that he didn't stick to that and 20 some years, sorry, 20 some years later came back and made Color Out of Space with Spectre Vision, which if, if you haven't seen it, definitely check out Color Out of Space. It's really good. Um, it has Nicolas Cage in it, if that motivates people to do that. Uh, just saying. And he's supposedly going to be doing two more films that are H.P. Lovecraft inspired. So, just so you know. It's also good that they have uh, Richard Stanley talk about his feelings about the original book and also his vision that he saw. Like, not only his vision for what the film was going to be in his mind, but also the vision of kind of what the original story kind of meant to him and what it meant to society and all the themes and the subtext in there. Because then... It helps you understand more of like what his grandiose vision was and potentially what the film could have ended up being. So it really sets you up ahead of time before they start taking you down the path of these are all the things that went wrong, giving you this overall idea of this is what the film was going to be. And it, it plays well for people who, for everyone really, whether you've seen The Island of Dr. Moreau or you haven't, or if you're someone like me who you've seen it, but it's been so long that you only remember bits of it and just remember that it sucked, <laughs> which is probably what most people remember from it. Uh, very aimless film, but uh, it shows his level of interest in it and also just the understanding of the material that makes you believe that if he was able to go through with his entire vision, 
that really it could have been something special because of how invested he seemed in it. And everyone after him, everyone else involved in it, I mean, certainly Brando and Kilmer didn't really care that much about the material because they were very much about kind of throwing wrenches into the gears as much as they could. But then also even like John Frankenheimer, when he came in direct after Stanley got fired, where he, you know, it just didn't seem like he cared that much about the, the base material. And that's one of the problems is when you have a director who comes in and they don't really care that much about the story, they don't really care that much about the base material, and they also are trying to change the vision, that's hard to make that successful then. And then you add in those extra aspects of, you know, letting people screw with it even more, like Brando, letting Marlon Brando make all these changes on the fly, and then Val Kilmer, like, being toxic on the set and causing people to have bad moods. You know, Brando could have done that too, to a degree, just because people could have just been getting very frustrated with how things were going with him. But by all accounts in the documentary, people were saying he was nice to people. He just was a, a severe pain, basically. Uh, whereas Kilmer was just a total jerk to everyone. As they said, like a, a high school bully or a, a frat guy bully or something. One of the biggest problems with the film, I, I don't, it's not something that can be changed or solved. It's just the fact that, and I'm sorry to say this because I like the guy personally, Richard Stanley is not interesting to listen to. What he's saying is interesting to listen to, and he's a very intelligent person. He has a lot of interesting things to say. The problem is the way he says it. He's very monotone. His inflection never really changes. It's always the same mode. And for that reason, you'll be trying to listen to what he's saying at, or at least this is my experience, I'll be trying to listen to what he's saying and then I'll just start to zone out. Like my mind just starts to wander because inflection never changes. And when inflection and voice changes, it engages people more. It kind of like catches, you know, it pulls the attention in. But when it's all just on one level and it never changes, no matter what that person's saying, it's hard to focus. And I knew, I knew this because A, I'd seen this documentary before, and B, I listened to an interview with Richard Stanley on Mick Garris's post-mortem podcast, which is a good interview because Mick Garris does a great job with interviews. So if you guys want to hear more from Richard Stanley, he talks about kind of like his, his childhood and his relationship with his mother and also his influences with H.P. Lovecraft because obviously they're talking about Color Out of Space. So that's why, but definitely check that out. But it just becomes hard to continually listen to him. The better parts are when other people are talking about their experiences and their feelings about Richard Stanley. So really, if they could have cut him down as much as possible, but still get through what he wanted to say, you know, you see what I'm saying? Like, this isn't something that can really be solved because he's got to be in the film. And it's important that he's in the film. And like I even said in the beginning, it's great that they lead with him and his vision and all that type of stuff. It's just hard to stay focused on what he's saying. The other thing is, not only is he very monotone, but I feel like he talks very fast from time to time, which I think maybe I do that too. Uh, but he also has a tendency to just run sentences together, and it seems like he should be stopping, and he just keeps going. And it's like a whole separate sentence, and he just keeps going. So for me, it's just a little bit tough. Maybe some of you out there are hearing me say that and be like, no, I didn't have that problem at all. And that's great. It was just a personal thing. Going over the concepts of what Stanley was going for fleshes out in your mind what the film actually would have been. And even more helpful with that are all those sketches that they showed, which looked awesome. Like those really colorful drawings of what some of those scenes were going to end up looking like. That made me very sad for the film that we never got. and it. But it was also cool to kind of like get that glimpse into Richard Stanley's mind at that time saying this is what it was going to be. This is how cool these scenes could have been. Uh, but then, you know, things went very bad. The talk about Mike DeLuca's interest in making the film and Bob Shea's indifference kind of ended up setting the stage for the chaos that was going to end up ensuing. The problem is when you have someone who's very interested in it and then you have someone who's not and they're both very much important to the making of the film, it's a problem. You know, people have to be invested. People have to care about it getting made. And I think to a degree, you know, Bob Shea did care because there's a lot of money being put into it. You know, it's his company. And he, obviously, I'm sure he did not want it to fail. But 
especially with someone like Richard Stanley, who was a relatively new director. He was very young and, um, you know, he had never done a bigger budget film before. He had never worked with very big stars on a set before. You need to have the right approach. Like, you have to take that interest. You have to be available. You have to, to a degree, be very nurturing in that way. And I think that's one of the biggest things that went wrong there is that they kind of left him to his own devices to a degree. They needed to kind of coddle him a little bit more, nurture him a little bit more, more and understand he hadn't done something large budget like that before. He's a great director, but he had only done small things. He had, he had been doing it in very small budgets where there aren't, typically are not, huge egos to have to deal with. And things are done very differently, very, very differently. And the expectations are a lot less uh, on that level as well. So I just... And I think that Richard Stanley didn't have the personality either to deal with some of the stuff he had to deal with, with the strong personalities who were fighting his vision, and then also the actors who didn't really necessarily want to listen to what he had to say or didn't respect him the way that he should have been respected as a director, because it seems like he he's more of a nice guy type. You know, a lot of the people they were that were interviewed, their opinion of him him was great guy, real nice guy. You know, no one was really saying he was a take charge type dude. He knew exactly where everything should be and was pointing out what everyone needed to do. And when someone challenged him, he put him in their place and he said, you know what? This is the film. I'm the director. We're doing this. So maybe I'm wrong and maybe it was just left out of the documentary. But the feeling I got from it was that he didn't have the personality to take control the way he needed to with that group of people and with the scale of how big it was. By all accounts, awesome dude, really good guy. But, you know, maybe that just wasn't something he could do, like handle a large budget film like that. Or maybe he needed to start, you know, a little bit lower first. But it also kind of did seem like initially they weren't going to be going that high budget as it ended up being. It's just things kept getting added and added and added, as, you know, as far as like the big names and how grandiose it ended up becoming. The fact that New Line knew how difficult Marlon Brando was and still wanted him for the movie because they worked with him prior, I think is really crappy, especially the fact that they dumped that on Stanley, knowing that he hasn't dealt with that before, knowing that this is his first time going after a big budget film. Um, it's just not right. That, and, and when you hear that in the documentary, like you're just like, ah, why? Like, like Bob Shea was talking about, like he knew that Brando was a problem. So why would you do that? There's so many actors out there. You could have done something else. New Line insisting on the cat woman being very human actually goes to show something that's kind of a problem with, with studio films in general, which is this trying to have this, this love interest, this romance all the time. And they knew that with the original vision of the cat woman, of how Stanley was seeing her as being more cat and more animal, they knew that like that wouldn't interest an audience, that it wouldn't hold up to the typical romance in studio films. But I think that it just would have been more interesting and would have been better serving for the actual storyline. So it's just another one of those things. Like studios put their hands in there all the time and it's like, why did you why did you hire a writer? Why did you hire a director? Do you believe in them or do you not believe in them? Stop changing things. If you're going to hire people to do the jobs, let those people do their jobs. Your job is to just put it all together, get the money going, distribute, all that stuff. Just saying. Val Kilmer complaining about not liking his role anymore was a pretty awful foreshadowing for this film. Uh, my feeling on it when I first heard it is... A, he's a jerk. B, dude, you're an actor. This is your job. Be a professional and do the role you already signed on for it. The fact that you then show up and you're just like, you know, I'm just not really feeling the role anymore. You know, think about anyone watching this. Think about your job. What do you what do you do for a job right now or jobs you've had in the past? Can you just go in one day and just be like, you know what? I just don't feel like I'm just not feeling my role at this job right now. Can you just have me do something else? Can we look at other things here? That doesn't work. It doesn't happen, especially not if you've already signed on, signed a contract, and you're getting paid a certain, a predetermined amount that you negotiated. It's just, it's, it's classless and it's crappy. 
the information on the animal behaviorist coming in to work with all the actors I thought was a really cool aspect. And this is one of the things I love about these documentaries that are kind of like give you the behind the scenes in a way of the films. I like knowing the challenges that came up or how they like interesting or weird ways that they got certain scenes done or they worked with the actors and got them to act a certain way. Like that stuff's just very interesting to me because it's it's that thing of you see the finished product in front of you, but then when you know everything that went into it behind the scenes, it gives you more of an appreciation. And then when you watch that film again, you're seeing that extra stuff. Like you're seeing what's on the screen once again, but then you're remembering all the things that went into that that you learned about. And that's what I love about it. And that animal, animal behaviorist aspect of it is a very interesting piece of knowledge. Uh, it seems that the relationship Stanley had with the cast and crew were more of a friend level and much less of a respectful, a respected leader level. That goes back to what I was talking about, about him just probably being too nice of a guy to really command a set like that. Stanley getting fired wasn't done very well, by all accounts. They even said it in the documentary. But Stanley then going and shredding documents... Um, as revenge basically is also not good. And, and I think he addressed that a little bit. Um, he seemed, you know, kind of remorseful about it. Like, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, but it's just one of those things where like people like be cool, like because someone does something bad to you, it's not good to do something bad to them back. So that's one of the things that I saw in this that I didn't like about Richard Stanley. But then once again, you know, he was young and people, he was very emotional. He was very wrapped up in this film, and people do stupid things. So, uh, I know it was said that John, uh, Frank, John Frankenheimer wasn't interested in that type of film. Uh, at one point, one of the guys was like, well, you know, he wasn't interested in making that type of film. It's not his type of thing. But I looked through his IMDb credits, and he had done the horror film Prophecy, and he had also done an episode of Tales from the Crypt. So even though he wouldn't necessarily be that interested, once again, like the Val Kilmer thing, it's what he was hired to do. It's his job. He knows how to do it because he's done Prophecy and he did an episode of Tales from the Crypt. So that's not really an excuse for things not going well under him, in my opinion. Uh, changing the story and vision of a movie during filming just seems like a terrible idea. I'm sure we can all agree with that. How can you make a concept like that work on the fly? And that's one of the biggest things is that, and and it's shown very well, like I said in the beginning of the documentary, there was a very big idea behind the creation of this film, uh, behind how the story from H.G. Wells was going to be brought to life. And to then start that filming, start that vision, and then replace the director and bring in someone who either has a different vision or doesn't even have much of a vision, and then allow the actors to change things on the fly, there's no way that's going to come out well. Just no way. Because when everything was so carefully envisioned and planned ahead of time, you have to execute that then, or execute close to it, instead of getting into it and just being like, oh, screw it, we'll just do whatever now. It's just not going to work. And I know that Bob Shea in the end said, you know, they lost money on it, but they lost less money than if they didn't put out anything. Well, yeah, but at the same time, you could have put maybe a little more money into it and stalled things a little bit and gotten someone else who was better for the job. I mean, really, Brando needed to go, Kilmer needed to go, and they should have gotten lesser-named actors. I think they became so hyper-focused on, if this goes to the theaters, then you know the name Brando and the name Kilmer will bring people in. That sucks, man. You got poor reviews, though, too, and I'm sure you did make some money because of the, the names Brando and Kilmer, but you also didn't make some money because it was terrible. there were terrible reviews for the film. So, I don't know, just saying. Focus on the right things. I'm not sure why Frankenheimer just gave into Brando, because one of the big things is they really, really talked about how good, how, like, known John Frankenheimer was for being able to command the set. And he was still one of those old school directors who would yell and, you know, make his presence known and take control and everything. But then for some reason, Brando shows up and he just is, is like, whatever, you know, he, he can't direct this guy. 
And I, you know, I get it that sometimes you get into that kind of like fanboy mode and it's just like, I love this person and it makes you nervous. But at the same time, are you a professional or are you not a professional? Are you doing the job or are you not doing the job? The fact that he let Brando commandeer the set is kind of unforgivable. And I think what he probably should have tried to do is been like, yes, Brando, we can shoot. How about this? We meet in the middle. We'll shoot it your way on in one take, and we'll shoot it my way in the other take. And then when it comes to the editing portion, we'll see what looks best. Then you just do that. You don't have Brando ar around for the editing because most likely he's not even going to be that interested in that anyway. And then you just leave all his stuff on the cutting room floor. That's my solution. That's what he should have done, I feel like. This really drives home what pieces of garbage celebrities can be. <laughs> even when they're getting paid really well, to do a job they're just unprofessional sometimes you know certain celebrities get to a point where their ego just gets way too large and they feel like they're allowed to do whatever but then it's also the fault of these studios directors whoever that will then allow them to do that it's ridiculous they become these monsters just maniacal things just spiral further and further out of control which you know generates a lot of interest for the documentary it's great for the documentary how insane it is but if you're Looking at things from the Richard Stanley point of view, it's just, it makes you feel worse and worse as the film goes on. Um, and the last thing about the actual film events is it's crazy to know that Richard Stanley, after being fired, actually ended up being in the film in so, to some degree as the dog man extra, which I just like that little twist in everything is probably the most compelling, interesting thing about it. And I love his kind of statement about going from being like the Dr. Moreau type character who was the creator and everything, and then ending up the dog man who was the creation. And I thought that was cool. Uh, so my closing thoughts on this film, uh, I feel like new line put, uh, put a lot on Stanley without actually knowing him as a person and knowing how he operates as a director then Kilmer and Brando walked all over him, and he didn't know how to deal with them, which threw him off of his vision. Actually, I don't think Brando even had shown up yet until Frankenheimer took over. So yeah, Kilmer at least. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Hollywood does destroy some, some directors like this. Uh, in this instance, like I was saying, I think it was a mixture of intentional, unintentional, and, you know, just wacky things that happen like that giant hurricane that, that messed some things up too but i would say one of the stories to look into it didn't fully destroy the person but it definitely did mess up their trajectory of their career uh xavier yens who became known to hollywood from his film frontiers that he did which was part of the french extreme movement of horror films he was brought into hollywood and he directed that movie hitman with i think timothy oliphant in it he shot it to be an R-rated film. Then the studio told him, oh, we need this to be a PG-13. And he was like, I did, I, I shot it as an R. You didn't tell me it needed to be a PG-13. I shot this as an R. This is my vision. This is my film. So they gave the footage to an outside party to cut it down to a PG-13 film. And it sucked. And Jens walked away from it and said, this is not my film. I want my name taken off of it. And, you know. Things like that happen in Hollywood, and it sucks. And and this documentary further exemplifies how things can get screwed up and how people's careers can get screwed because of this type of stuff. So Hollywood, there's a lot of problems with it. But anyway, this documentary, done well, shot very well for the most part. There were a few moments where the interviews with Bob Shea, the lighting, got it got really dark, excessively dark on Bob Shea. Um, so that's like a, just a little bit of a technical issue. Like I said, maybe if they could have cut down a little bit of Richard Stanley talking would have been nice, but um, I'm not sure they really could do that. Uh, but overall, good. Really well put together. The pacing's really good. It doesn't feel too long or anything. They cover the topic quite well, so I quite enjoyed it. Um, it's not perfect or anything. Um, they might have been able to cut it down just a little bit. No, they might have actually been able to add some. I enjoyed it, but... So out of five stars with uh, half stars in play, I'm going to give it a four-star rating as far as the documentary goes. It's good. I enjoy it. And uh, like I said, I want to see more of David Gregory's stuff. I'm going to seek that out. But anyway, give me your comments down below about what your thoughts on this were. 
Um, love to read those. And do me a quick favor, though. Hit that subscribe button. Um, that's what you can do to repay me. Now, you know, if you like any videos that I do here, I'm, I'm just doing it for free, spending my time doing this. So um, just hit that subscribe. I really do appreciate that. And also hit the notification bell if you're going to do that because it lets you know whenever I put up a new video or when I'm doing a live stream or anything like that. But regardless, thanks for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.